Hello, I'm Eli Ribble with Authentize, and today I want to show you how to use 3DX, which is Authentize's 3D printing platform. Uh, the platform is a constellation of various services that does things like model storage, manipulation, uh, rendering of model assets, slicing, G-code generation, and streaming that data to printers, managing and controlling printers, queuing, all sorts of different uh, services that you might want to use with 3D printing. I want to show people how to get started. Uh, I'm going to use Python today, one, because Python is the best language in the world. Also, it's highly readable, and it's powerful enough that it should allow us to do what we want to do with relatively few lines of code. So we'll get started here. Uh, on my left-hand side, I'm going to have my script as it evolves, and on the right-hand side, I'm going to be executing my script periodically so that you can see the output. Uh, here's a great example. We run it. Uh, we've got a simple main function here uh, that simply says, hello, hello, everyone. And this is how we get started. So anything I use today is going to be either part of the Python standard library, or it's going to be a third party library that is extremely common. I don't want to use any sort of SDKs or libraries that are specific to 3D acts or authentize because I want to show that this is entirely easy for any developer to pick up and use as long as they're fairly familiar with HTTP, how it works and how to send requests. I'm going to be using the requests library because it is beautiful and makes HTTP requests very simple in Python. First, we're going to create a session. A session is sort of like a browser session in that it will manage cookies and state for us as we make various requests. Uh, but it maintains the same simple API that the bare requests library has for those of you who may not be familiar with request sessions. Everything in DX is JSON, uh, both going in and coming out. So I'm going to actually define my uh, payloads that I'm sending via HTTP requests as bare Python objects and then have JSON libraries serialize those for me. Uh, yes, uh, don't do what Donnie don't does. This password is awful. Don't use it anywhere. But hey, it's really easy and fast to type. Okay, so we're going to make our request now. Uh, 3DX is composed of a constellation of different services that are managed via DNS entry. So in this case, I'm talking to the user service, which is in charge of user authentication, permissions management, that sort of thing. Here, I'm going to hand in my JSON payload, which will take the raw dictionary I've defined up above, serialize it to JSON, and send it off. Then we just need to assert that the response came back OK. That means that we got an HTTP status code of uh, 200, give or take. Uh, in the case where it's not, we're just going to print out what the content of the response was uh, with a nice stack trace indicating where the failure occurred. What we should get back is a cookie that sets our session. And we can pull that out like so. And we're just going to pull it out and we're going to show it, make sure this works correctly. Well, that's new. All right, so we run the code here, and we can see that the request went out. We got a response back. It came back OK. And here is my session cookie, which is an encrypted cookie that has information about my session and indicates who I am to the rest of the system. You'll notice that the domain is set to anything that ends in authentize.com. That is so that we can talk to various other services, the slicing service, the model storage service, the printing service, that sort of thing, and maintain the same session throughout. Um, just to show that my assert code is working, we're going to mess up my password and we'll run this again. What we should see is a nice JSON formatted error message that indicates that I have sent invalid credentials over the wire, as well as a nice human readable format. And this is the standard with 3DX services. As you'll see, uh, usually machine readable static error code, as well as a human readable details about exactly what, what went wrong. So this is working great. Let's factor this out into its own uh, helper functions. Uh, first off, we want some way of asserting that the response was okay. We'll be using this frequently. Uh, and secondly, we'll want to pull off the uh, login since most of the rest of our script will be using that. 
and we don't really need to print out the information from our, our session. Uh, just to be sure this is working, we can also uh, pull down information about our session directly. In this case, I'm not creating a session. I am just getting information about the session. And then we can extract the response body as JSON uh, just that easily. And what we should see here, hold on. is me failing to include yeah that was a mistake there we go okay awesome so we're going to pull down our session information uh, here's the email address associated with the this account uh, you can see there's me uh, whether or not this is ephemeral which indicates that it is actually a fully registered user as opposed to a uh, very temporary fake user uh, the name, tester to authentize, and then the URI for this particular user, which is great, and the username. So this just tells me I have a valid session, some simple information about my session. From here, we can go right into doing something useful with DX. So grabbing the session information is really not super important. Uh, so what is something useful that we could do? Well, we could have authentize start to store models for us. Uh, we have a redundant service in the cloud. It also handles uh, versioning and descendancy. You can render snapshots of the model and things of that nature. So let's stick a model into the cloud. Uh, first off, we need to, we're gonna need to create a model resource. This tells the system that we have the intent to upload a model and kind of creates a place for the model to live. Uh, there's my payload. I've included this auto align. Uh, that's because any model that gets uploaded to 3DX, we will automatically align it and center it to uh, the zero to the origin in the 3D space coordinates. Sometimes designers accidentally have the model floating off in space in one form or another, and usually that's undesirable for printing. Uh, so we're just going to indicate here that we don't want that. That will cause the uh, the processing of the model to be a little bit faster. It makes for a, a bit of a better demo. So now we just need to send up this model information. Of course, we're going to make sure that the response came back OK. And we should get two headers back. One is the location header of the model. That is uh, where the URI or the URL of the new model resource that was created for us. The other one is a special location header where we should send the model data. For now, let's just print both of those values out. Make sure we got this correct. Okay, great. So right here we can see that this new model is gonna live in the model service uh, with a nice long UUID. And also we have an upload location. This is a signed S3 URL because we do use Amazon S3 as our backing store for our model service. This signed S3 URL is gonna give us a certain amount of time in which to use this upload link before it will expire. And uh, we can use that to upload the model directly. This makes 3D Axe extremely scalable because we're relying on Amazon to do a lot of the scalability uh, heavy lifting for us. So now that we've got those, we just need to open up our model. Uh, in this case, we're going to use a model called Broken Squirtle. Uh, this is, of course, Squirtle, uh, the infamous Pokemon from everyone's childhood. Uh, though we've removed some of the polygons in the model, so it's actually broken. It's it's non-manifold, and that's to show off a couple things a little bit later. Okay, so what we need to do is put this uh, model data into our upload URL. We have to include headers that indicate the content type. In this case, it's always going to be application octet stream. Uh, and that's just because we're working with Amazon S3 and it makes that work. Make sure that this response came back okay. And 
and we should end up with a nice uploaded model. Now what's going to happen with this is we've created the model, then we're going to upload the data for the model uh, directly to S3. This is going to create a message uh, for our backend to then download the model to analyze it uh, and to uh, update the resource information about the model. That's going to take just a little bit of time to happen. And so it's not going to happen synchronously when we make this web request. What we want to do instead is pull the resource for updated status about what's going on. And we can do that below here. In fact, it's probably best we put this in a while loop because uh, we want to see sort of the progression of the state of the model as it, as it goes along. So let's um, leave our, you know, let's make a helper function. That's probably the best way to do this. Um, so what I'm going to have here is a helper function that we can use to wait until a resource reaches a particular status. So all we do is pull against the resource URL using our session. We're going to assert that that request worked. We're going to pull the content of the resource out of the URL. And then we're going to print out that data so that we can see it, as well as a little line break. Makes things look nice. And then we'll just sleep for, oh, say half a second. And what this will do is we'll come in here and we'll loop, we'll get the resource, we'll parse it, we'll print it out, make a line break, wait half a second, and then do it again. And we'll keep doing that as long as the status is not one of the listed statuses. And what we can do then is wait on status using our model and uh, We'll break any time we hit an error or if the model ends up being processed. And that should work just fine. Uh, at the end here, we'll actually return the data because we may want to capture information a little bit later. But for now, that should work. So let's see if uh, we got this right the first go. The answer is no. Oops, that was a little bit silly. We're going to call the function, not assert that it's a function. OK, great. There's our output. We'll go back through this. Here's the model as soon as we create it. Uh, we can see that the analysis here is incomplete. Uh, we've not indicated any callback. This is so that uh, when we upload information about the model, we can tell the system, hey, hit this publicly addressable URL with callback information. So as the model is processed or there's errors, it can interact with another web service and do sort of push notifications rather than having to pull for status. Since I'm working on a laptop here and I don't have a publicly addressable IP, uh, I'm just going to avoid callbacks. Um, children we could ignore for now. That's for different analysis and versioning type sorts of things. Created time, of course, is right now. There's the name. Uh, number of polygons, we've got nothing. We don't know anything about the size. Uh, that's because this model is not uploaded yet. And that's fine. Now we've performed the upload. And we can go back and take a look at the status. And we can see manifold false, which we expected it not to be since we intentionally broke this model. Uh, we've got the content. We could go there and download the model ourselves right now. It also tells us the number of polygons as well as the size in millimeters of the entire model. Uh, this snapshot's kind of interesting. We'll come back to that in just a little bit. Uh, but we can see that the uh, status has now become processed and its type is an STL. Fantastic. So. We now have a model in 3DX that we can perform operations on, uh, scaling, rotations, different things like that. Uh, before we go much, much farther, uh, let's use the snapshot status. And since I've already got this model uploaded, we don't need to upload it again. So we'll just pull out the URI here, and we'll use that for the rest of this session. I'll keep some of my helper functions here, because I'll continue to use those. But let's just set our model up here to that the model resource we created. The rest of this, we don't really need. 
All right. So what is the snapshot? Well, 3DX includes a service to do uh, ray traced based uh, renders of models so that we can see them as we manipulate them, show previews, that sort of thing. Uh, anytime a model gets uploaded, we create a default snapshot. We have the capability of manipulating the material, uh, the color, the number of samples per pixel, the orientation, camera lighting, all sorts of things like that. I'm not gonna get into those today, they're a lot of fun, uh, but I wanna try to show as many services as I can. So let's get, yeah, we'll pull out the data on our model. The snapshot, of course, is gonna be, uh, we better make sure this worked. Excuse me. All right, so the snapshot is going to be this uh, snapshot resource here inside of the data that we returned. And we can actually do a get on that. In fact, why don't we just create a helper function to do that? All right. So we're going to get our data on the model, immediately pull out the snapshot, and then our new data is gonna be get and return. And I realize my variables are poorly named. I'm doing a demo, what are you gonna do? And we should be able to print out our snapshot data now. Let's clean this up here. And there we go. So all I did was I got the model resource that I had shown previously, pulled the snapshot value out, then I did again get against that snapshot resource so that I could get it. And we can see here, uh, there's a color for the snapshot. We can actually get the content. That will be a PNG image, again, stored in S3. The status is that the snapshot has been rendered. It is 480 by 640, and it's done 10 samples per pixel with the ray tracing engine. So what does that look like? Well, that's a great question. Let's write the data to the file system, and then we can take a look. Just got to open up a file here. Writable binary, that's so that we can take the binary PNG data and stick it directly on the file system. We'll need to download it first, of course, which we can do by pulling the content value, that's this value over here, out of the resource. We'll download that directly. And then we just need to write the uh, contents of the response out this will come as a stream of bytes. Oh, we should probably make sure this works before we get too much farther. And that will let us know that we've done the right thing. Let's see. Got the resource. Uh, maybe we use the correct property name for getting the data out. We wrote the snapshot. Let's see if we got it here. We sure do. All right, so uh, let's just open it up then. There it is, a rendered broken Squirtle. So uh, we rendered this, of course, in uh, a beautiful authentize orangish yellow. Uh, and there's the various polygons that we ripped out of the model across Squirtle's nose and his chest and kind of on his arm and stuff. We were, we were pretty brutal, the poor Squirtle here. But this just shows you uh, what the render engine looks like. At 10 samples per pixel, it looks pretty good. We got a little bit of nice shadowing here. We could bump this up. We could change the size of the image, change the material, uh, so we can get some different uh, properties and get a, an accurate rendering of what this would look like printed. Uh, also manipulate some lighting and things like that. But this is pretty good for a default. It gives you a really good sense of what your model is as soon as you get it uploaded. Okay, so what else can we do with this model uh, once we've got it into 3DX? Well, I mentioned that we can do slicing and we can generate G-code. So let's do that now. Let's see, we'll just delete what we had here on the model itself. We won't be needing any information about the snapshot. This, as usual, the 
we uh, set up a resource that we're going to create for doing the slicing. Authentize uses several different slicing engines on the back end, and the slicing service is designed to be a consistent front end across those different slicing engines. In this case, we're going to be using Slicer, which is a well-known open source slicing engine used for consumer printers. Slicer does a pretty good job. We need to specify a few parameters for our slicing engine. Filament diameter, of course, is important for calculating the volume of plastic that's extruded. Nozzle diameter is, of course, the complement to that, which tells us the diameter of our extrusion nozzle so that we can know how much plastic to push through and how much, how, the size of the bead that we'll get out of the other end. Uh, we'll use ABS for this. Sure, why not? And our print quality is a really rough uh, sense of how to tweak various parameters for our print. In this case, we'll do a fine print. This adjusts things like uh, layer height speeds, different things like that. So now we send these parameters to the slicing service, which is called Quick Slice. The first thing we're going to do is create this configuration resource. The idea being that you can reuse configs uh, if you want. Make sure that it came across OK. Make sure I can type correctly, uh, which occasionally I can. And then we just need to pull out the location header, which will be our config. And we'll just print that out, make sure that it's working. Great, so I was able to make my config without any problem. Next up, we can actually create the slicing job itself. For this, we just need to pass in the configuration that we want to use, which we've just created, and we'll pass in the model that we want to use. So we slice that model using that configuration. Uh, the model, of course, we created in previous steps. Again, we post this to the slicing service. Make sure that comes back OK. And our slice should again come back as the location header. Now, as before, uh, we'll need to pull for the status as the slicing job progresses. So we can use our wait on status call. I want to say it's called process. That sounds about right. Uh, so we'll create our config, we'll create our slice, and then we'll pull our slice's status until it indicates that it's process. There we go. OK, and we're complete. So let's scroll through here a little bit. Um, here's the initial configuration that we're using. Uh, when we first initiate it, we don't really have a good sense of the estimated slicing time. Uh, we do know the model that we're using. We can indicate that, yes, it is, in fact, processing. After a little bit of time, we get an estimate. 370 uh, milliseconds, really not a great estimate. On a slice this short and fast, the estimate is sometimes not exactly accurate. Uh, honestly, estimating slices is hard, and uh, it's a process for constantly refining. We wait a little while. Uh, unfortunately, Slicer doesn't give us a clear idea of the progress as it's moving along, but eventually we can see that the status is processed. The total time taken was an order of magnitude off from our estimate. Yeah, sorry, we're working on it. Uh, but we eventually did slice uh, our, uh, we did our slice job, we created our G code. And here's the content of the slice. Let's, uh, let's pull that down and take a look at what that looks like. Uh, and yeah, we'll we'll pull that down and what the heck, why don't we just print it out? This should actually end up being the G-code for our slice. I'll clear this out so it's not quite so messy. I'm actually going to create a brand new config and a brand new slicing job. So it's going to go through the whole thing. Our estimate's exactly the same set, the same parameters. Oops. <laughs> My mistake. I forgot to include the content here. Try this again. 
Yeah, it's hard to do an HTTP request against a dictionary in Python. Difficult to map that to an actual address data and stuff. Okay, here we go. Uh, Slicer actually ends the G code with uh, information about all of the configuration parameters that were used. But up here we can see the G code for our slice. Uh, just that easy, just that fast to get uh, slicing taken care of using DX. We could put this on an SD card, stick it in our printer and print it right away. We could also uh, pull it up using Pronterface and stream that directly to our printer. We can build whatever process we want. The nice thing is uh, 3DX provides a system, a, a series of building blocks that we can use to create uh, whatever 3D printing process suits us. Okay, there's just one more thing that I want to do with this, and that is uh, show how DX integrates with various partners to expand the capabilities of the printing uh, pipeline. One of these partners, uh, Mick Printable, can take our model and heal it, which is an attempt to repair the various polygons that I've ripped out of the model. So we're going to actually send our model up to Mick Printable and have them repair it for us. So we can start by removing all of the work we just did for creating our slice. We'll still need the model, of course. So make printable requires me to have an API key for DX to use to identify me as the user to make printable. Uh, since I don't particularly want to leak that here, uh, I'm just going to pull it up from a file, uh, and it contains my API key and stuff like that. It's kind of a pain to create new accounts, and I'm shockingly lazy, so I'm just going to avoid having to create a separate account that I can leak here online. All right, so in order to create manipulations to models, we post transformations to the service saying, please rotate this, translate it, scale it, or in this case, heal it. So the URL I'm going to request is actually a sub-resource of the model, which ends in transformation. We'll print that out just so that you can see what that looks like. Now I need to create a payload that identifies my transformation. In DX, we can actually set a list of transformations to make for a resource. So we could, in fact, say, I would like you to translate, then rotate, then scale, uh, then gosh, I don't know, then heal it or you know, something else. But you can do it in a, in a series. And so the parameters that we send up are actually going to be a list. Uh, most of these parameters here are going to be um, particular to make printable. So wall thickness is a parameter that they want. And we're just going to leave it at one. Print quality. Uh, we'll just set the standard here again this and these are parameters that we could manipulate and see what happens on make printables side as we do things the point being DX provides a consistent API uh, for all of these different services so the authentication is the same and the JSON payloads and things like that are the same but we also expose parameters for different providers so that as a user, you can get the best experience possible. The goal is to create a system where it's very cost effective and fast to switch between different providers for different services so you can find the provider that uh, provides the best value for you. We're going to post our payload to that URL. Let's just make sure this worked as we usually do. And then we are going to uh, pull for our status. Um, we'll abort on error or on process. So what's going to happen when we create this transformation is it's going to create a new model resource, which will be a child resource of the original model. And it's going to send the request off to make printable. We will then process it, heal the model, send it back to us, and then we'll populate that child resource when the process is complete. And this should actually be enough for us to uh, send off our model and wait for it to come back and be repaired. You know, assuming I were to have done this correctly.
Ah, of course. Um, I need to use the location header. Yeah, my problem is uh, when I send off the request for the transformation, it sends back a location header saying, okay, here is the resource that you should pull for status. I didn't pull that resource out. I tried to do a get against the original transformation, which doesn't work. Okay, great. So what happened here is looking through the status, it looks the same as our original model. Uh, primarily, the status is not uploaded. That's because it hasn't been uploaded by Mick Printable yet. It's still in, in the process of being processed by them. Uh, but eventually, we get complete, and we have our model all processed here. So let's go over and see what's going on with Mick Printable then. This integration is a full integration with their system. So that means that we can actually use their website and take a look at it. Here's our Squirtle model. If we bring it up here, we should be able to see, oh, there it is. Oh, I'll zoom out a little bit. Oop, man, I meant a little bit. Okay, so no holes in his face anymore. Everything's all repaired. Now he's got a nice kind of goldish color. That's pretty cool. But yeah, Make Printable did a good job uh, finding all of our holes and fixing them and getting our model ready to print. We could then move on to slicing this model. We could actually download it and export it. We could do other operations on it. Uh, our integration framework is wide open. There's documentation. Anybody who wants to build an integration against DX can. As long as they adhere to the interface standards, we don't actually have to know about them. They indicate that they would like to provide a service, such as model healing. Uh, they follow our standards for authentication and data security. And our, their service will then be listed along with other services of the same kind and be uh, hot swappable for anybody who wants to use the service. So this has been an overview of using 3DX. You can see that it's uh, really quick and really easy to use and you can build a process pipeline uh, any which way you want using each of these different services. Uh, hopefully we'll uh, see you online sometime soon. Thank you.